And don't tell people about your problems. Do you know that 90% of the people don't care? <laughs> and the other 10% are glad you got them. So you're better off to keep it yourself. You're going to have problems. But have fun with what you're doing. People say, I want to give you a simple plan to enable you to follow those five assumptions. And this is not something I talk about, it's something I believe, and it works. And I wish that I had learned it when I was 21. There's only three rules you have to follow. You know, we have all kinds of laws, federal laws, county laws, state laws, corporate laws, bylaws, and in laws and outlaws. <laughs> we only need three laws. Law number one, do what right. Do what's right and avoid what's wrong. If you have any doubt, get out the Bible. I do not think it's right to find a teammate's wallet before he lost it. See, that's called stealing, son. I found it, but he hadn't lost it yet at all. I understand. Just do what's right. There's never a right time to do the wrong thing. And there's never a wrong time to do the right thing. Just do what's right. I think it's right to be honest, right to be on time. I think it's wrong to practice sexism, racism, spousal abuse. I think it's wrong to be bitter. We've all had injustices done by society, by a spouse, by a professor. Do respect professors. I prefer to my own. But you know what? Don't go through life where you're being bitter, where you pass away, your spouse has to hire six ball bearers because you don't have friends. Just do the right thing. And I think it's also right to have an excellent positive attitude. See, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy life, have fun. You're going to have problems, you're going to have difficulties. That's part of life. Because you graduate doesn't mean you aren't going to have problems. And don't tell people about your problems. Do you know that 90% of the people don't care? <laughs> and the other 10% are glad you got them. So you're better off to keep it yourself. You're going to have problems. But have fun with what you're doing. People say, did you have fun doing the ESPN? Not really. I was up there in Bristol, Connecticut, which was 15 minutes from Hartford by telephone. <laughs> and I'm on there with a guy named Mark May. Now, I love Mark May, beautiful guy. But we have a difference of opinion. He was a player. As a coach, he made suggestions. I made decisions. He showered after work. I showered before work. He signed a paycheck on the back. I signed it on the front. You know, just different opinion. But you know what? When they turned the red light on, I was going to have fun. If you have fun doing something, people have fun being around. Every day I walked out on the football field, first thing I said, boy, what a great day to work, and I meant it. Because if you have fun being there, people have fun being around. Doesn't mean I don't do dumb things. And sometimes I wasn't real honest. One time, Mark May said something about my golf game. I said, I want you to know I'm the best golfer at Lake Nona. Well, Lake Nona, we have about 15 pros. Graham McDowell, Henry Stinson, Dion Poulter, just around. Well, I go back, everybody's on me. You lied on TV. I said, let me tell you something. 300 members know I lied. 300 million people think I'm a hell of a golfer. So, <laughs> I like that percentage. But just do what's right. And don't let people tear you down. Don't let people. Many years ago, we I take my family down to Orlando, Florida. We have four children, they're all girls but two, and I'm real proud of that fact. And we're getting ready to play Orlando, we're getting ready to play Florida in the Sugar Bowl, so we go to Orlando where we had a home, and we go out to dinner. The waiter came up, he recognized me, he said, you're new holds head coach of Notre Dame, are you? And I said, yes, sir. And I got out my pen thinking he wanted an autograph. He said, let me ask you a question. He said, what's the difference between Notre Dame and Cheerios? I said, I don't have a clue. He said, Cheerios belong in the bowl, Notre Dame doesn't. Now, these are absolutely true. It made me mad, got me in a bad mood. And my wife said, you're going to let somebody you never met before, you're never going to see again, don't care a thing about you. You're going to let them ruin the evening because something stupid be said, and she's right. Don't let other people control your attitude. That's you. I felt so good a little bit later. I called the waiter back over, and I said, son, let me ask you a question. What's the difference between Lou Holtz and Lou? The GoPro gets tips, which he found out when the meal was over. This <laughs> uh, was right. Rule number two do everything to the best of your ability with time alone. You know, ladies and gentlemen, not all of us.
must be all American, not everybody be first team. Everybody can be the best you're capable of being. And I want to tell you, if you want to fail, you have the right to fail. That's what's great about this country. You do not have the right to cause other people to fail. Because you don't do everything that you're good at. When you join a spouse, you bring a child to the world, you join a business, you join a team. You have obligation responsibilities and you owe it to other people to do the maximum you can at each and everything you do. It's not complicated. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know this. I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, I know. I was born in Fallsby, West Virginia. <laughs> and I went by where I was born last night about 10.30. I was born in a cellar at home. Delivered by Dr. McGraw. We had one bedroom for my sister, myself, and my parents. We had a half bath and a kitchen. Seven and a half years we lived in that place. There was no welfare. There was no food stamps. There was no safety net. But I always had plenty to eat. Because every time I asked for seconds, my dad would say, no, you had plenty. But the reason I was born with a silver spoon, my dad had only gone to the third grade. That's all the education he had. But why was I born with a silver spoon in my mouth? Because I was taught by my parents that life's a matter of making choices, wherever you are, good or bad, because of the choices you make. Don't blame anybody else, but if you get an education, you're willing to work and overcome problems and difficulties, in this great country, you can amount to something. That's how I, that's why I was born with a silver spoon. I was in this country and I was taught personal responsibility for choices you make. And when we talk about a commitment to excellence, that's a choice you make. And the last rule, show people you care. And you walk in the room, your attitude, hey, here I am, look at me. It's like, no. Your attitude, there you are, how can I help you? See, my wife, God bless her, my wife is a stage four cancer survivor. Weight went from 129 to 89. They gave her 10% chance to live. I'm happy to report my wife's doing well now. I don't even pray for her anymore. I pray to her. I, I mean, she's the same. But we're opposites night and day. She said opposites attract and then attack. But she's also, <laughs> she left me. She doesn't, we're opposites. She doesn't have a sense of humor, but she left me a note a couple months ago said, Lou, I can't please everybody in the world, so I'm going to stop trying. I'm going to focus on pleasing one person a day, and today's not your day, and tomorrow doesn't look real promising either. So. <laughs> but she is my best friend. We've been married 54 years. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I was on a, I was on a golf course. I said, yeah, I'm married my best friend. The guy said, your wife's not your best friend. I said, yes, she, he said, your dog is. I said, no, you're wrong. He said, you're wrong. He said, try this then. Lock your wife and your dog in the trunk of the car. Come back in two hours and see which one's happy to see you. So, but my wife never does interviews. She'd done one interview in her life because I asked her, what did you learn from having cancer? She said, I learned how much my family loved me. Now, we, we didn't love her anymore. We showed her. Why does somebody have to go through something like that before we realize how important we are? Ladies and gentlemen, I received this honorary doctor's degree, not because what I did, because what other people did. It's the same thing. Never receive recognition, pass the credit. It's not complicated. You're just genuinely caring about people because everybody you're going to meet the rest of your life needs a smile, needs a kind word, needs encouragement. You see, when you do the right thing, people are always going to be able to trust you. My wife and I have been married because we can trust each other. I never lose the trust. The only way people are ever going to trust you is if you do the right thing. That's all God wants us to do. Do the right thing. The second thing is do everything that's your ability, because then people will know you're committed to actions. You want to be special. Not to say, hey, here I am, but help other people. You care about people. See, a lot of you are going to be successful. You're going to go make a lot of money, and when you die, it ends. But hopefully, everybody in this graduating class is going to be significant. Significant is when you help other people be successful. And 
for a month, buy a new car. Want well, to be happy for a year, win the lottery. Want well, to be happy for a lifetime, put your faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. Amen.